Welcome to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age, the show designed to help make middle age your prime time of life by defying the notion that once you reach 40, 50, or even 60 years old, your crowning achievements are all behind you. Regardless of whether you're just approaching 40 or are firmly entrenched in your middle years, it's time to launch your very own personal journey toward a joyful and purpose-filled second half of life. Each week, host Roy Richards, an expert on midlife renewal and author of A Midlife Challenge, Wake Up, will discuss the challenges common to middle age and help guide you to a brighter tomorrow. Now, here's Roy. Well, hello and welcome to this week's edition of Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age. And today we're going to address a subject that has generated controversy and discussion over a number of years. Should we punish our children, and if so, how? With young children, those under 12, the primary issue has been the appropriateness of physical punishment, in particular spanking, but today we're going to broaden the discussion to include all forms of punishment, physical, emotional, and mental. And to some of you, this may come as a surprise, but my guest today, esteemed author and child-rearing expert Emily Slingloff, is here to convince you that you shouldn't punish your kids at all. In fact, in 2013, she wrote a book on that very subject, Parenting Without Punishment, a little book about a big topic, and we're going to talk about that book today. And here's Emily Slingloff's background. She's a lifelong Virginian, a former assistant editor of the Virginian Pilot newspaper. She suffered through three miscarriages, but has raised two very successful children, and now has two grown grandchildren, and years ago, suffering from her miscarriages, she dedicated herself to studying all aspects of parenting, the actions of parents and the reactions from their children, and as she puts it, she came to realize that the results of various parenting styles are predictable, and she's author of two other books, A Present to the Newborn and Choosing Happiness, and regular listeners may recall that Emily Slingloff was a prior guest on our program back on July 3rd, 2017. And hello, Emily. Welcome back. The middle age can be your best age. Oh, I'm so glad to be talking about this. I just got shivers as you were talking, <laughs> thinking about it all. All right. Well, <laughs> can I your, start? <laughs> in, in your book, Parenting Without Punishment, you explain that there's never a uh, reason to punish children. Can you explain uh, explain your rationale for this seemingly radical conclusion? Oh, right. Not only is there not a reason to spank them, but there's a huge reason not to spank them. All right. I would say for those listening right this minute that these might be the most important words you will hear in your lifetime. How mm-hmm. about that? I mean, and I mean, I do believe in God. I'm not talking about God right now. He's in everything to me. But, yeah. but what I'm talking about is so huge. And I think right now, as everybody is, I think in this country of the violence going on right now, yeah. and the reason for it. And you know the reason? The reason is people who hurt other people yeah. are unhappy with life. Yeah, people that's... who are happy with life don't want to hurt other people. No, you know, a mass murderer is not a happy person. Happy people don't want to go out and kill people. Happy people want to be nice. So why are some people, this is the point we're talking about, why are some people happy? I don't mean happy from Hershey bars or a new car or something. No, I mean happy inside, in a piece. <laughs> why are some people happy with life and some people are not and we can all remember this, if nothing else, the formative years are called formative because they're formative. Yeah. And the main influence then is the parent. Well, let's, all right. let's say you're so, a caring parent. Punishment love, specifically. All right. Yeah. Well, let's all right. say you're a caring parent and you love your children very much. You hate to punish them but you're deeply concerned about their safety and welfare. And let's say you have a six-year-old who's been told never to run out in the street who does so repeatedly to retrieve his or her soccer ball. As a parent, shouldn't you set firm limits when your child's safety is concerned? And if you don't punish your children, 
uh, in some way when they dis- disobey, perhaps threatening their own lives and safety, how can you protect them? Now, that doesn't have to be mm-hmm. spanking. Maybe a One time out or... bring that up. All right. <clears throat> you can say, don't go in the street. Never go in the street. If you go in the street, you're going to be punished. And listen to me because I'm your mother. Don't you dare go in the street. Yeah. Or you can say, let me tell you about going in the street. <laughs> Cars come, and they're not always looking out for little children, or sometimes there's a car coming in the other direction, and they can't help it. And and I know a child that was hit by a car, and her leg was cut off, and she was never, ever able again to go swimming in the ocean or to dance. She couldn't really walk right. She had a wooden leg. It was horrible. Explain it. Explain. Be kind, not mean. Yeah. Punishment, <clears throat> it's interesting. I wrote my first book many years ago. <laughs> I was asked by the school where my two children went from till they graduated from there and went to college, and I was asked after they both finished college what we, my husband and I, had done with our children before they went to first grade. Oh. And <clears throat> that was my, I, I didn't do it right away. I was still modest, but asked again very strongly. I got to work, and husband at night would go over it for about a year. And I wrote a chapter in that <clears throat> called Rules and Punishment. All my chapters are really short in that book. Yeah. But I said, <clears throat> if you have rules and punishment, it means there are two sides. Two sides. And since then, I've expounded on that so much. <laughs> but just think about it. Do you want two sides or do you want one side? Do you want the parent to be on the same side with the child? Yeah. Yes, they're on the same side. So why not? Help the child talk, communicate, and never have rules or punishment. Hmm. You can have guidelines, suggestions, and communication can be the result if a guideline is questioned. You can always talk, 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 but never, never, never hit, never be mean in any way, emotionally or physically, ever. And the child will be an entirely different child than one who has been punished. Yeah, people I, I, who are happy with life are what we want. Don't we? don't we want people who all are happy so that they are kind to other people? Isn't that a worthy goal for everybody in this country to be nice to everybody? That's for sure. And, and um, it's a funny thing that's all going on now, but I mean, I, I feel sorry for people who are mean because I know they're unhappy. Yeah, people who are sure. who are happy are kind to other people, and that's what a child will be. Will be kind. I'll tell you. I put a recent <clears throat> I put a tweet on yesterday oh. because I was reading this book I have that, <clears throat> about spanking, yeah. and I just quoted quoted him. It's a book that he uses a lot of quotes. Am I talking too much? I hope no, not. No, I've got too no. much to say. No. Right. He said, <clears throat> "An animal exposed to stress and neglect." in early life, develops a brain that's wired to feel fear, anxiety, and stress. The same is true of people. Yeah, we had a recent guest on that talked about how many people are living on automatic <laughs> based on how they were treated as young children. And, and right, and, and, but, 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 but we want parents to realize they don't have to do just what their parents did. No. They, they can think about it themselves and think what makes more sense. And all kinds of, that that book that I wrote was just my common sense. And I didn't state it as this is what we did. I stated it as philosophical, but, but short, all of it. But since then, this has been a thrill to me, almost every single thing I've put in there is being proved scientifically. Yeah. And it has been proved. Now, this is fascinating for everybody listening. You're going to be shocked, some people, I think. It has yeah. been proved with scientific evidence that a child's brain is damaged if that child is abused as a young child. Yeah, I'm not Did you know that? that that's, no, I, I, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, but, but, it's so important. Everybody remember that. Remember, never, never, never spank the child, never hit the child, never even be mean to the child. Why? You want the child to be nice, and you love the child. You ask for the child, you want it. If you don't want a child, don't have one. We can't even give the child a time out like they do. No, there is no reason to do time out. No reason. Instead, have time in. 
Okay. Have time in. My children, my two children, when I brought one of my books out, I said, I'm thinking of calling it Time In. And they said, that's yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up doing something else. But that, of all times, is when you do not want to send the child away. If the child has done something, I can't imagine what it is. People punish their children for so many ridiculous things. Mm-hmm. Didn't eat his dinner or knocked over a dish. I can imagine. <laughs> Whatever. Um what you want to do, though, if it's and worse than that, if he's done something that's a little harmful, you want to talk to the child. You want to hug the child, sit right by him and talk and explain and have him with you. The last thing you want is to send the child away. Yeah. Never have time out. Well, here I would venture to guess at middle age, a number of most of our listeners probably, their kids are now free teens or teenagers. And how should we alter our approach to parenting once our kids reach the age when they know it all and think mom and dad are relics of the Stone Age? How best can you communicate with a preteen or teenage son or daughter uh, who immediately tunes you out whenever you attempt to enter their world? How do you keep that communication going? You know what I'm going to say, I bet, don't you? No, I don't. I hope you do from what I've said. I hope everybody listening knows what I'm going to say. The child who has been treated with kindness instead of with meanness, instead of with punishment, will like the parent and will care about the parent, will not be uncaring about what the parent says. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, I I would agree with that 100%. A lot of times they really want advice from their parents, even though they won't admit it. (laughs) Well, and sometimes, even if they've been abused, they will. But the less they've been abused the more they will like the parent, and if they're not abused at all, it is fantastic, wonderful. There's no question about it. Well, let's talk briefly about your great little book on the big subject, as you call it, Parenting Without Punishment. In the America Amazon promotion, you uh, inform that parenting need not be considered difficult. You tell us it is easy if, as parents, we follow three basic principles. And what are these three principles? They make so much sense. Oh, right. <laughs> I love that. And I wrote that book not thinking I would ever write another book after Norfolk Academy. It asked me to write that one, and I did yeah. the comprehensive. I love that first book. It's comprehensive. Um, I love all three that I wrote. The, the last two are very short. They're all three short on purpose. But what um, I realized, people were complaining about their children so much. And the last thing I would ever do is complain. And they was, people would say, oh, it's so complicated and so confusing and on and on. And I thought, this is ridiculous. And I gave myself three points to put in a book. One, yeah. two, three. Okay? Yeah. One, realize the importance of the job. Yeah. I mean, the job of parenting is surely the most important job there is. I'll be glad to talk about that as much as you like. I've asked many, many, many people if they can name a job any more important than the job of parenting. And you know what? Not one single person has ever said, no, there's another job more important. Not one single person. People think, 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 try to think, and they all say, no, it's the most important. Anyway, we do a job better generally if we think it's important. So, number one, realize the importance of the job. Number two, set a goal. Number three, reach the goal. Yeah, the first one's easy. One goal. One goal. Set a goal. You're telling us as parents we should attempt to predetermine how our child should grow up. Ultimately, shouldn't we leave that decision to the child? What kind of a goal are you talking about? I'm going to say it right now, (laughs) and maybe you can already tell from hearing me. Now, I'm not talking about a goal when the child is um, several months old, and some parents have the goal of having the child sleep through the night. That breaks my heart. We loved it when our child would wake at night and call for us. We would immediately go in. My husband would and bring the baby into bed with me, change the diapers, bring the the baby in, and I'd nurse the baby and go to sleep, and then we'd maybe take it back. And I would say, call if you need us. We're right here. Um, That's another story. We loved that. That, Some people have a goal when the child is a tiny baby, and then that goal changes when the child gets a little older, and they'll have a goal of not asking me so many questions, which, again, breaks my heart. It's asking questions they're learning, and how the parent responds matters hugely. I could talk about that for an hour. But um, 
And then there'll be another goal when the child goes to school that they do oh. this and get good grades instead of learn is what too many yeah. people have a goal for for the child. And <clears throat> on and on. And then marry the right person and make money. All these things. One goal. Suppose the child was all those things that I just named, all those horrible things, yeah. and was ha- unhappy with life, was an unhappy person, depressed, needed to go to a psychiatrist. Yeah, that okay. would not be a goal. The goal is happiness. Okay. Happiness yeah, is a so- huge word. The goal of psychiatrists in treating patients of any age, and I'm quoting now, the goal of psychiatrists in treating patients of any age is happiness. And when you think about it, absolutely. Nobody goes to a counselor for help if they're happy. They go because they're unhappy. We're not talking about uh, setting a goal. I want my son to be an engineer. (laughs) Or uh, I want my daughter to be a French language teacher. You don't set specific goals. That's their own decision. You just... A goal is to be happy. (laughs) Well, to be happy inside, right. Yeah, yeah. And it set that goal of happiness, and if the parent is kind, the child is likely to be kind back to the parent and to others and be happy. That is what it is. That's what it takes. But so set one goal, not a goal that changes all the time, and just remember it from the moment the baby comes out of the woman's body. You want that baby to be happy with life. Yeah. You don't want to let the baby cry in the crib and not yeah. go to the baby. Some people think you should do that. No, no, no. When the baby cries in the crib, go answer the baby. Put yourself in the other person's place. If you were that baby and you made a little cry, you would want somebody to come. The baby doesn't know how to talk. It doesn't even know why it's crying, maybe. It yeah. just knows something is wrong, or maybe it's not. Maybe where am I? And definitely the parent should always go to the baby crying in the crib and pick that baby up and hold it, do whatever. But the <clears throat> parent can't hold a baby too much. It gives it yeah. security forever. But so, well, who is your um, book written for specifically? What would you say? Who is it written who, for? Who is your book written for? Is it... Uh... I mean, is it certain types of parents that you Oh, my gosh, parents? no. Any parent. Absolutely, absolutely any parent. But anyway, so, but, but to finish that, that's um, set the goal and then reach the goal. Have a, realize the importance, set one goal, reach that goal easily by being a positive parent, not yeah. a negative parent, being on the child's side. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's written it? for everybody. What I say is, is, um, <clears throat> is, is works with everybody i mean we want mental healthiness right <laughs> we, i've been on so many shows discussing these mass murders yeah. and <laughs> without any question the, the reason for them always is the same the mass yeah. murderer is unhappy and well, where's the best place for our <laughs> listeners to go to preview and purchase your book parenting without oh them? oh amazon has them and um my name is so hard for people to remember and, you know, just go to Amazon and Parenting Without Punishment might not have, might not come up, might come up easily. A present to the newborn is the first one. Oh, and then yeah. Parenting Without Punishment. What, and you have a last one is called Choosing Happiness. To, uh, what's your website where people can learn more about you and you have a whole bunch of helpful blogs and you have Q&As for parents? What's that website address? Oh, thank you for asking that. That's really helpful, too. Um, it's my name, Emily Slingloff, dot com. And, and Emily is D-M-I-L-Y. Yeah. Slingloff is S as in Sam, L-I-N-G-L-U-F-F, Slingloff. Yeah, um, com. Oh, gosh, how they ever remember that, hearing it as they're driving in the car. <laughs> I well, don't no know. one can disagree with Emily's basic uh, pr- premises, and that is, me, uh, treat parenting as the most important project you'll have in your whole life. It's more important than your career and lifestyle. And be on your child's side. You're on the same team with clear parenting goal in mind, whether he or she is a charming three-year-old or a confused, often surly teenager who at every turn seems to be brushing you off. Believe it or not, your teenage offspring needs you More than not, not as a dictator, but as a coach and as someone they can communicate with at the deepest level. And throughout the child's growth and development year, help your children set personal goals, then celebrate with them when they meet those goals. 
In the word of one of the customer reviewers on Amazon, the author presents compelling reasons for treating our children with respect, kindness, and love. And this approach is easy to understand and implement. And if everyone parented this way, we'd live in a gentler world. I think that kind of sums up the why it's worth uh, reviewing that book. I love it. I, lo- I love it. Um, and, and I've got to say, when you talked about the surly teenager, there's no reason to have a surly teenager. Teenage years can be so much fun, so wonderful. And there's yeah. no reason. The teenager will not be surly if you've been kind, if the parent has been kind all along. Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned respect. So many people say, the child just doesn't respect me. If the parent wants the child to respect the parent, you know what to do? Yeah. The ch- parent should respect the child. Okay. Always, always, never forget it. That's the child is sure. worth respecting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Emily Slingloff, for your visit today. And please continue to spread that message of love on the wonderful benefits of uh, parenting without punishment. Bye well, thank you. And if people call you, could they find out how to spell my name if they don't remember? Oh, yeah. They, <laughs> <won't be happy laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks so much. I, I wish it was simpler for, <laughs> for yeah. people. Maybe I should have figured that out a long time ago. Change but, your last <laughs> name to Jones or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I could change my name. But my husband wouldn't mind. But um, my dear sweet husband's dead. But, <clears throat> oh. wow. Um Anyway, no, I think um, just to remember to be kind is is what matters, and and my website is full of good advice too. You're right, yes, but sir. I think yes, have sir. fun. Be your child's friend. You may have heard not to be his friend. Be his best friend. Okay. Okay, or her best friend. <laughs> or her, right, thanks, right. Thanks so much. <laughs> Bye for now. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Bye. Well, we begin this segment with some disturbing news. Stress really can kill you. And here are the facts. Today's 50% of the U.S. population is experiencing one or more stress-related diseases. Does that include you? Furthermore, what our society and the medical community is doing to mitigate the adverse health effects of stress just isn't working. And don't take my word for it. My next guest, Dr. Stephen Hall, M.D., has been studying the causes of stress and searching for an effective solution to relieve it for over 30 years. And he explains that medical science now believes that every aspect of our lives, from how we eat, sleep, and exercise, exerts some influence on our state of health. And therefore, if you have health challenges, any aspect of your life, not just physical ones, could be their cause. And one of the biggest negative influences on your health is stress. But here's the good news. Dr. Hall has discovered a solution to enable you and I to get off this vicious stress cycle for good, and he's here today to talk about how you can overcome stress once and for all. And here are Dr. Hall's qualifications. Stephen M. Hall, M.D., uh, practices a dynamic form of medicine that combines traditional and alternative modalities, and he's residency trained in family practice, Dr. Stevens' consuming curiosity propelled him out of the traditional medical box as he sought answers to his patients' seemingly unsolvable medical problems, and this led him to explore and incorporate wisdom from many other systems of healing, including nutrition, homeopathy, hypnosis, functional medicine, and osteopathic manipulation, in addition to his clinical practice in Essequah, Washington, I may have mispronounced that. It's a suburb of Seattle, and Dr. Stephen teaches a phenomenal online class, Taming the Bear, Taking the Bite Out of Stress, and he's author of the 2018 book, The Seven Tools of Healing, Unlock Your Inner Wisdom, and Live the Life of Your Soul Desires. And hello, Dr. Stephen Hall, and welcome. We're indeed honored to have you with us here today. Well, hi, Roy. Thank you, and I'm very honored to be here. Well, early on in your medical career, you began, uh, became aware of a significant shortfall in conventional, uh, conventional medicine as it's practiced here in America. And what is that shortfall? Well, mainly they're focused on treating the symptom. Yeah. And, um, and most of the medications that we use just uh, interfere with 
you know, what that disease process is doing in your body. So, yeah. you know, you take a medicine to lower your blood pressure, well, your your high blood pressure is actually not the cause of your high blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, I, I like when you say, uh, or in the forward in the book, I think it said, humans are treated like mechanical objects. <laughs> Doctors treat the results, not the cause. <laughs> That's so well put. <laughs> Right. On, on your website, stephenmhallmd.com, you reveal that you practice what you call integral medicine to address patient health challenges. And can you please give us a brief definition of what you mean by integral medicine? Well, yeah, I borrowed the word from Ken Wilbur. If any of your listeners are familiar with his work, he's a philosopher that said, you know, this is the first time in human history that we've had access to all of human knowing. Yeah. And he says, I wonder what all the different world traditions have to say about going from a, you know, a newborn baby to a fully actualized human being. Yeah. And so he's synthesized and integrated all this information from all over the world. And, and I looked at that and said, well, you know, everything in your life exerts some kind of impact on your health. So we need a system of medicine that can take your whole life into account, not just your biochemistry. And so by applying his worldview, he he calls it integral worldview, and just applying the medical process to that, then I came up with what I call integral medicine. And, And with that, I'm able to treat not just your biochemistry, but also um, how you feel, how you believe, um, what motivates you, um, what do you love, what are you afraid of. You know, you can, we can take all those different aspects into account. Um, all the beliefs that you formed as you were growing up through your childhood. Um, just yeah, I've been to the doctor a number of times. I've never had a doctor ask me any of those kind of questions. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's amazing because it has such a huge influence on how you see the world, and then how you see the world determines how your body responds to your experiences. Yeah. So, well, yeah, it's, it's a, I'd, like a, to, I'd like to turn to the problem of stress. On your website, you offer access to an article you have written titled "The Health Effects of Stress." Can you very briefly identify what a few of these most serious negative effects are? Yeah, one of the best ways to think about stress is is about how does your body manage its own resources. And and so stress is kind of like um a wartime economy. <laughs> and and when you're at war, where do all your resources go? Yeah. <laughs> and to make them bo- into bullets and more, right? Yeah. And and when you're in peace, where do your resources go? You know, into your schools and roads and hospitals and and that sort of thing. So your body is the same way. So when you're in stress, all your energy is going into getting you ready to run or fight. Yeah. And when you're at, and, and so then digesting your food and fighting infections and rebuilding your bones, all those different processes take a back seat. Yeah, that's a good and, point. And then when you're um, at rest, then you can digest your food, you can uh, fight infections, you can rebuild your body. Um, So the problem is getting into that stress response and staying there too long. We're just not wired for it. It's okay to do it occasionally, but just day in and day out like we do nowadays. Yeah, there are times, obviously, if if a uh, bear is coming after you, it's good you are stressed. (laughs) Exactly. It motivates you to run if you can outrun the bear. But uh, (laughs) all this, this constant stress we're under and this, 24-hour news cycle and all this other gobbledygook that we go through nowadays. Well, a common response to stressful thoughts and emotions is to attempt to repress them. But based on your research, is repression the optimal way to deal with stress? No, it's not, because um, when you repress something, you are actually putting your own creative energy into creating more of it. Oh, yeah. and, you're being and that's stressed why that, over forgetting the stress. <laughs> yeah, and and you can't fool your body anyway. It's still yeah. responding. And so um, 
Now, you, you do have to face it. So, like, what a lot of people are doing now with stress is they're just, just renaming it and thinking that's going to be the answer, you know. What do they but whether call, you call it, it now? <laughs> like, work-life balance or, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's not going to change how that affects your body. No. And whether or not it makes you sick. Well, on your oh, you gotta, oh, Excuse me, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, we just got to face it head on, and we can talk about how to do that, but go yeah. ahead, you had another. Well, on your 12-week online class, Taming the Bear, Taking the Bite Out of Stress, that's designed to teach participants how to keep psychological and emotional stresses in the mental area, thereby helping them deal with most life situations and to maintain their uh, healthy balance. After completing Taming the Bear, what are a few of the things that uh, the students are able to do? Well, they're they're able to really watch themselves and see how they're doing inside, uh, and they're able to acknowledge the truth of that, so yeah. they're not repressing or denying it. And then they're able to just be kind to themselves about it. And and what we find is that self kindness uh, is what works the change. Yeah. And so. Yeah, experiences that used to, like, raise your blood pressure or uh, get your heart rate going just suddenly start looking like an interesting challenge or uh, an opportunity to learn something new. And um, and you have a whole different set of chemicals that your body releases uh, when you look at things a different way. Oh, and great. so the job is to get in there and change how you look at things. And yeah, now speaking the, of that, you've written a book to help folks uh, unlock inner wisdom and to manage stress and overcome physical health issues. It's titled The Seven Tools of Healing. Uh, what do the seven tools, or where do they come from? Do they come from outside or somewhere inside yourself? They they came from inside of people. And I see. so when I was first starting my career and realizing I, I was seeing all these patients that I didn't have a good answer for based on what I was taught in my medical training. Um, I, so I started looking, like I said, outside and studying nutrition and herbs and body work and uh, Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine. And, and, and it's a huge amount of information, as you can imagine. I mean, I'm just trying to keep up with conventional medicine is a huge amount of information. Yeah. And so I realized, well, there's got to be a simpler way. And I learned through the clinical hypnosis that I'd studied and some of the body work that I studied that we all have inside of us a deeper knowing. And one of the things that deeper knowing is doing is running our physical body. So, you know, imagine how many different biochemical pathways are going on inside your body at once. And, your own inner knowing is coordinating all of that and monitoring it and adjusting it and trying to keep everything in balance. Yeah, and, you and call it the inner knower and uh, other people might call it the higher self or some people call it the soul or the, your Buddha nature, Christ consciousness. You uh, name all those various things it's called by different uh, folks around the world. Right. And you know, when something is recognized in lots of different traditions and down through time, and yeah. then there's probably some validity to that concept. And yeah, I would say there is. <laughs> time will yeah. Be. And so it really reinforces this idea that we have this deep inner wisdom. So my thought was, well, what if I just help my patients get in touch with that deep inner wisdom, and then it could tell them what they need to do to get back into balance. Yeah. Uh, because there's thousands of different therapeutic options. Yeah. And how do you know which one is going to work for you? And can, so that's I know what, we don't have a lot of time to go into detail, but can you briefly identify for us what each of these seven tools of healing is? Yes. Yeah, so, um, but so the, just to quickly answer your first question, that, oh, so sorry. the seven tools came out of how I watched people's own inner wisdom help them. Yeah. That's yeah. that's where they come from. So the first tool, um, I use the word faith, even though that pushes a lot of people's buttons, and it's really misunderstood. Um, but how you, the people's inner wisdom uses faith is it's actually like a measurement of how strongly you believe what you believe. 
So an atheist can have faith, you're saying. It's not just religious-oriented, although obviously Christians of faith or, or Jews or whatever religion, uh, Muslims, have, they, their faith is related to belief in a supreme being, but it doesn't have to be, I guess. Right. I mean, you can believe in unicorns. You can believe in aliens. You can believe in angels, whatever, you know. And yeah. and so the faith itself doesn't say what you're believing in. It's just saying how strongly you believe it. And so then obviously there are certain beliefs that help you and certain beliefs that get in your way. So yeah. we talk about, well, why not choose to believe what helps you the most? Yeah. And for a lot of people, believing in a supreme being that happens to be kind and compassionate really helps. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then the second tool is awareness because it's much easier to work on something if you know it's there. Yeah, that's yeah. for sure. If and the issue we have gonna address it. <laughs> as humans is so much of our mind is happening in the background, in, in the unconscious yeah. mind. Yeah. And so awareness moves things from the unconscious from the not known over into the known. Yeah, that and, makes a lot of sense. And another name for it you hear a lot nowadays is mindfulness. And, yeah. And there's tons of research on the benefits of mindfulness, and um, there's lots of advice on how to practice it. And so, but then the question is, well, then what do you do with what you become aware of? Yeah. And what the inner wisdom says is you've got to accept it. You've got to acknowledge it. Yeah, that's um, the third tool as, as acceptance. Exactly. And how I see that is that's like putting the starting coordinates into your GPS. Yeah. Your inner your inner GPS that can help you navigate your process of change. And if you don't put in where you're really starting from, you're not going to get the right directions to get where you want to no, go. No, that's for sure. Right? If you put in where you wished you were, <laughs> it's not going to be helpful direction. So, you're going so circles, that is, then. <laughs> yeah, and that acceptance helps cut through. Um, you know, we all have a lot of resistance and denial, and 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 there's this fear that we have that if we just accept what is, then it's going to always be there, and so yeah. we can't accept it because that's defeating order. And and the opposite is actually true. Yeah, so you can't really change something until you accept it. No. And then 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 how do you actually get it to change? So. When you get in there and try to force a part of yourself to change, what happens? You, you get into a struggle with it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Frustration and struggle and more stress. <laughs> yeah, and so what, inner people's, what people's inner wisdom says is, well, just get off your back about that. Just, just be kind to yourself about that. And, and so what I've noticed is as people start practicing that, kind acceptance of whatever's going on in their life right now. I call it the truth in the moment. Yeah. Um, then the kindness works to change. You don't have to make it change with your ego mind. Yeah, that's uh, have compassion on yourself and on others. I know that's the fourth uh, tool you talk yep. about. And it's surprising how many people have never thought to have compassion for themselves. Yeah, that's they're, so true. They're really compassionate towards animals or towards the people they love, but for themselves, they're usually their own harshest critic. Yeah. And, and, and this helps turn that around. And then the other tools sort of follow from that. I think of the foundation as a, the faith as a foundation and then um, tools two, three, and four, the awareness, acceptance, compassion is like the workhorse yeah. that works to change. And then once you bring enough compassion to a particular situation, if there's any forgiveness that needs to happen, either forgiving someone else or forgiving yourself, it'll just naturally happen. You don't you don't have to force yourself to forgive. And we don't need to condone or reflect what someone else did in order to forgive, I guess. You right. Make, you don't be firmly convinced what they did was wrong, but it still only harms yourself to keep that grudge going and not forgive. It may hurt or harm the other person. If you do, but it's mostly hurting yourself to keep that hang up. Exactly. That's, yeah, exactly. And so, so the forgiveness is for you. Yeah. For your, for you know, to help you along. And then, generally, once you've forgiven and and really practice that awareness uh, in a kind way, you, you sort of get this glimpse of what how things work behind the scenes. And yeah. And. 
and that no matter what you're going through, you actually really are deeply cared for. Yeah. And, and that will bring on this like sense of awe or the sense of gratitude. Yeah. And which is a sixth tool. <laughs> six tool. And when my patients come in and say, you know, I wouldn't choose to go down that road again, but I'm really glad I had cancer because of all the stuff I've learned from it. Yeah. Then I know they've gotten a healing that, that, cancer experience was holding for them and and i've had people say that about all kinds of traumas and diseases that yeah. they'll that they're thankful they went through it even though it was a really hard road to hoe yeah. because how much they've grown and and gained from it well, what about so, the final tool right action i know uh, at some point for results to happen we have to get up off the couch and do something but how do we determine what is right action well, that's an excellent question because there's no recipe for that. Yeah. And philosophers have been, Western philosophers have been debating about that for over 300 years. And um, what I see is that right action is based on right understanding. And so the more you get to know yourself, yeah. the more you can make choices that fit you. Yeah. And, and so if you're really aware of what's going on in the moment, you'll know what to say to that child in front of you yeah. or you'll know what to choose to eat or how to exercise. Yeah, that's and so, a good point. Yeah, inner, so that's how you The real get, inner you will tell you, the real self, as you call it, will sort of tell you what the right action is or it'll just correct. fit, kind of flow. Yeah, because no published list of shoulds knows your moment-to-moment -moment biochemical needs. Yeah. So following somebody's diet plan might not be what your body needs right then. Well, I know in your 2018 book, The Seven Tools of Healing, you dedicate a full chapter to defining and explaining the benefit of each of the seven tools. I know that's a big part of your book. Right. There's Yeah. And that's just to flesh out that there's a lot to understand about each of these. It's taken me years to understand how the inner wisdom helps people with their own life change and personal growth. And and I tried to put everything I've learned in there, so that's why the book's well, a little bit encyclopedic. Who is Can non-medical laypersons like me benefit from reading it, or is it mostly for fellow doctors? No, it's it's. I intended it for lay people. I tried to keep the language very straightforward no, and simple, and I put lots of examples in and exercises. and But it's basically for anybody who wants to change yeah it, anybody who has something about themselves or about their life they wish they can improve and especially if they've been trying and are kind of frustrated with their yeah. results well, where's the best place for our listeners to go to preview and purchase your book the seven tools of healing well it's on amazon it's on barnes and noble um those are some of the best places to get it uh the publisher uh balboa press can sell it as well and um, and then I have another website called uh, www.the7tools.com. Oh. And, and that's where you can access um, the classes. So, so for example, this well, in just a few days, well, starting the 24th of November, we're putting on a, a summit. Uh, we call it the Change for Good Summit, oh. uh, building, re building Resilience in Anxious Times. And we've collected 21 different experts in all kinds of different fields to talk about anxiety and what to do about it and how to make yourself resilient. And um, it's, it's free to people. If they want to go to the seven toolscom and sign up for that summit, um, they can listen for free. And it's Is that the be, number seven or is seven spelled out on your website? It's the number seven. Okay, the, se the number seven tools dot com. Yeah, and and then also I'm excited about we've been working all summer on the curriculum for a class that we call Strong Foundations, oh. on teaching how to teach your children to be healthy with their feelings. Oh, that's a great subject. Because know. one of the biggest dysfunctions I see in my patients is we're all we all have trouble being healthy with our feelings, and if we can learn it from childhood, imagine how much of a benefit that would be. Yeah. So that's going to be an online class that we're going to launch in um, January. Oh, that's but that's, 
there'll be information there on the website as well. Well, in conclusion, the message from Dr. Stephen Hall is both alarming yet comforting. As he indicated, stress in today's 24-7 lightning-paced society is a serious problem for half of all Americans. Furthermore, if that includes you, it is unlikely that you will obtain significant lasting relief from your primary conventional medicine physician. And the good news, the resolution can be an inside job by applying Dr. Stevens' seven tools of healing to access and alter what is in your non-conscious mind. And for years now, Dr. Stephen Hall has been helping folks contact and consult with their inner knower to ask the questions in their lives that have them most puzzled. Questions like, what am I really supposed to be doing with my life? Or what is this illness or discomfort asking of me? And how can I heal it to move forward in my life? And the seven tools are really very simple, and I'm sure you won't find anything in them that you haven't seen before, but they are incredibly versatile, applicable to any problem you may face, including stress or a stress-related illness. And uh, best of all, you can practice them, as Dr. Hall points out, whenever and wherever, each and every moment of any ordinary day. And to sum up the benefit of Dr. Stephen Hill's book, The Seven Tools of Healing, I quote from a forward by Dr. Bernie Siegel, who my wife Gloria greatly admired from watching him on TV. And he said, The Seven Tools of Healing by Dr. Hall contains the wisdom of the ages. We all are exceptional and have potential to achieve healing. Love yourself and participate in the healing. This book will be your life coach. And if you're suffering from any malady brought on by stress, or for that matter, any other cause, I highly recommend you preview and purchase Dr. Stephen Hill's book, or Hall's book, The Seven Tools of Healing. (coughs) Excuse me. Thanks a ton, Dr. Stephen, for joining us here today. And may you have continued success with your book, your practice, and with all your outstanding classes that are coming up. Well, thank you, and I really appreciate the work you're doing to get a word like this out to the world. I'm so appreciative, so thank you. Word that needs to get out. And to our listeners, goodbye for now. Join us again next week when we explore some of the hidden factors in chronic pain. Bye for now from Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age. You've been listening to Middle Age Can Be Your Best Age, hosted by Roy Richards, an expert on midlife renewal and author of both A Midlife Challenge, Wake Up, and Wake Up, Captain and Crew, Restart Your Engines. You can learn more about Roy and his Middle Age Renewal Training System by visiting his website, middleagerenewal.com.